I'm a, I'm a different person. I couldn't stop crying. Uh, I went home from the hospital and I knew something was just terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> I was one of the lucky ones that had uterine orgasms. And I just kept telling my husband, I said, well, we have to do this over again because I, I, something's wrong. And what happened was something was removed from me that was integral to my sexual experience. And it, it never again would be the, the same profound thing. And then I went to an endocrinologist. We were trying to put back what my ovaries provided. And you can't put uh, an organ back with a drug. And when my husband, Brian, who really did stand by me, uh, would come home from work at night, I would sit on his lap and cry. And he would rock me. And uh, several months into this behavior, uh, he said to me, she, she ruined you. My wife signed the standard consent form, which in Michigan I assume is similar to most other consent forms. It basically says the patient's been advised of all the possible bad things that can happen as a result of the surgery. In fact, she wasn't told of anything that might be negative or harmful from the surgery. She was told of how much better she's going to look and feel four weeks after the surgery. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Only by compelling full and complete disclosure of these things are women going to be able to make informed decisions. And you have an opportunity to be a leader in this country in requiring that. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Tawanda Queen. Um, my experience with informed consent for hysterectomy started with a routine gynecological visit in 1997. At this time, I was 34 years old, single, with no children, working in IT, attending school part-time, and providing support to my mother and great-nephew. I contacted an OBGYN who had delivered my niece. At the initial con consult, I informed the doctor that a hysterectomy was not an option and I was interested in and was only here to see if she could perform a myomectomy for my condition to remove the fibroids only. I was given a number of medical forms to complete at home and presented a myomectomy consent form. This form was expected to be signed immediately. Upon reading the form, I was surprised to see reference to a possible hysterectomy. When I hesitated on signing the consent form and inquired as to why this reference existed, after all, I was not signing a hysterectomy consent form. And was I in danger of having a hysterectomy? She started waving her hands vigorously and shaking her head and saying, no, no, no. She then wrote on the consent form, most likely the uterus will not be invaded based on the pre-op sonogram and MRI reports. At this point, my only concern was that she understood I was not having a hysterectomy, so I signed the consent form. It has been 12 years since surgery, and I've experienced much physical pain along with a complete short circuit of my body as every function has been affected and diminished. I reduced my life down to the bare minimum in an attempt to continue working, cut out social and family outings, hobbies, vacations, school, etc. All activities and expenses are centered on supporting my disabilities and creating an illusion of normalcy. What I realized after my experience with informed consent for hysterectomy is that I had no business making any decisions concerning my fibroid condition without having knowledge of my anatomy or an understanding of fibroids. I trained at St. Vincent Hospital here in Indiana, um, and I'm a physician at St. Francis Hospital here in Indianapolis. Um, OBGYNs, this is what we do for informed consent. We have our patients watch a video. It's not the HERS video. It's, 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 present, it's prepared by the American College of OBGYN, who goes over all the complications, foreseeable complications. Um, the patients then um, will take a test after they, after they watch that video to make sure that they understand what's presented by that video. Um, and if we feel comfortable that, that, um, that all the information has been correct, then we then um, again, get, uh, again go over it verbally um, to make sure that the patient is well aware of what is what's going to happen to them. Um, I will let you know that, that the Joint Commission on I'm sure you've heard of the Joint Commission on the Reddition of Hospitals, which is JCAOH, um, has severe sanctions for hospitals that are not in compliance with informed consent. As a physician at St. Francis Hospital, we have to handwrite five um, problems with, with uh, potential problems from the surgery before the patient is even put to sleep, before while the patient is still awake, before they even get anesthesia. So uh, again, there's a lot of discrepancies that I'm just very questioning in, in, in this bill. Um, I think that the, uh, the lack of informed, informed consent really comes, it comes down to the patient-physician relationship. Again, we've heard a lot of testimonies and, 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 and some sad stories. But what's happening in Indiana, I'm not really sure that that's what's going on with our other states that have been presented here today. The Indiana State Medical Malpractice Act 
um, is already in place in Indiana. I mean, we have severe sanctions for doctors that, that have bad outcomes, repeatedly have bad outcomes. The patients have an opportunity to uh, for litigation if that's if that's in their in, in, feels that that's in their interest. Um, I think also the ramifications of this bill is 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 far beyond just hysterectomies. I think I'm going to be opening up a lot of potential for committee time, discussion time for not just hysterectomies, but possibly all surgeries, all dental surgeries, neurosurgeries, everything. Um, it's just really more than hysterectomies. I will tell you as an OBGYN that 80% of women that have hysterectomies are completely satisfied with their surgeries. 100% um, satisfied. Um, and that's a little bit different than our anecdotal stories that we've heard here today. Um, we are in, in, in total, again, in, in summary, we are against the Indiana State Medical Association and Indiana ACOG is totally against this bill. Um, thank you very much. Do I have any questions? Questions? <laughs> Sir, did I understand you to say a few minutes ago that there could be a concern that this would open up, open the door for all surgeries, not just this? Yes, <laughs> sure. Husbands who sat with the surgeon and, and was lied to, as well as was my wife. Um, uh, Chairman Brown and the members of the committee, what's happening is that informed consent truly is not being given, and, and maybe it's not in other circumstances as well, but without question, there's, there's no doubt in this particular uh, situation, and it, and it does impact the lives of, of women out there. And we just want them to know the truth, and it's not being given to them. I've not talked to one single woman that was told any of the information about their and, and about their anatomy and the truth about it. It's, it's just all we've lost over. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Yeah.